All right, you need more security in your application packaging, which is kind of a catchy title. Uh, let's get the boring part out of the way fast. Uh, I'm a system administrator. Um, I work at Red Hat as a support engineer. Um, I'm a little bit of a salty guy, so don't panic if I get too cynical or, or angry. Um, I'm also a member of Sysarmy. Sysarmy is the Argentinian systems community. And I'm also one of the organizers for Nerdyarla, which is kind of like our nerd conference down there. And if you're uh, wondering how it looks like, uh, picture over a thousand nerds all together in the same place. So before we actually begin the talk, I have a fair warning to give you. Uh, as I said, I'm a system administrator. I'm not a developer. Um, the opinions on this talk are my own. They're based on uh, my experience and my observations on the subject. Uh, this talk has a fair bit of jokes, uh, all of which are made with uh, good faith. Um, and I have to tell you, I don't have any magic solution for what I'm about to, uh, to show you. I'm only pointing out the problems and showing you what we have right now and throwing my ideas so we can ignite a conversation, a serious conversation on this topic. And most importantly, always look on the bright side of life. So first things first, we uh, just saw the terms security and packaging together. Um, so let's uh, get the boring definitions out of the way and define both. So packaging is the process through which an application is delivered typically to an end user. Whereas security, uh, uh, no, not that one. That one, uh, this type of security in the broadest sense of the term information security, we are talking about being protected against the unauthorized use of information. This typically involves an attacker um, attacking an application in order to gain something from it, like for example, stealing user data. Now, with a show of hands, how many of you have actually related both terms, security and packaging, like ever? It doesn't count if you saw the, the title of the talk. <laughs> OK, good. So you're probably wondering, what's the deal? Why am I mixing both terms, since you probably never uh, thought of mixing those? And why am I making a talk out of this when there's so much good out in there in the world? Wait, there's not. The deal is that the current state of delivering software uh, regarding is, uh, with, regard, with regard, sorry, to security implications is something like this. So we are the little house in the prairie, and we're about to be engulfed by a pyroclastic cloud. And where we want to go is this. And some people think all is good with the world, and we're already there, but unfortunately we're not, and as you just saw, we're there. So. In order to understand the point of all of this, we're going to have to first look at the uh, different roles involved in getting an application from the developer to uh, the end user. And that way, we'll be able to understand what the problem is. Um, also note that some of the roles that I'm going to talk about might not be that evident at first. So we first have the developer. And that will be, I think, most of you guys. Uh, the developer is mainly focused on coding and drinking coffee, I think. Uh, he's the one who knows the most about the application, the architecture, etc., and also the correct way to install the application. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the end user. The end user just wants the application to work. Um, that is assuming we have a way of knowing what the user wants. Whoever tells you that, he's blatantly lying. We don't have any clue what the user wants. Uh, the user, of course, knows next to nothing about the application. He's just a user. Uh, he doesn't know how to install it. He's basically as helpless as this cute little baby. Cute, but helpless. Now, for the more obscure roles, we have first the system administrator. Whether you're running a hosted service for your application, or you want to deliver the application to your users, or just keep the infrastructure up and running, you're going to need someone who has systems knowledge. And it's going to be this guy. Maybe not this guy in particular, but someone who looks like that. So what does a system administrator want? Uh, as a system administrator, I can answer this. We want a free weekend. A free weekend, no work, and maybe a beer will be nice. So for that to happen, the application has to be, uh, in, to put it in simple terms, easily installable, and it must not crash or 
it, it must survive a catastrophe, an attack, or whatever. If it doesn't, we have an unhappy sysadmin. And last but not least, there's the security administrator, or InfoSec for short. I, know, I actually know some of these guys. There's a big security conference in, in Argentina every year, and all they want is to see the world burn. That's really all they want. Um, actually, not all companies might have these guys. Uh, in the case of some companies, the information security role might be mixed in with other roles like networking and whatnot. And to all those companies out there without a guy like this, I'm going to tell you this, you're doomed. So to put things into perspective and better understand how the, all the roles work together, uh, let's look at it like this. Everything starts with a developer deciding, hey, let's release this. Let's make this available for users. He then goes over to the system administrator uh, so the application can be deployed or built or wherever. And eventually, the application is delivered to the end user. So the system administrator is basically our bridge here. Then the InfoSec guy comes along, and he seems to be lashing out at everybody. But in fact, what he's actually doing involves interacting with all three roles. He gives security guidelines to the developers in regards to architecture and good coding practices. He gives architectural guidelines as well as good op operations practice to the sysadmins. And well, these two are uh, the proactive ones. So he wants to prevent bad stuff from happening. But there's also a reactive one uh, in which he tries to keep the user at bay whenever the user tr decides to become a hacker and attack the application. So uh, in short, the system administrator is the guy who will help you package the application and deliver it to your users, whereas the InfoSec administrator is the person making sure things run as smoothly as possible and nobody dying in the process. So these two guys. Uh, Maybe for some of you, it's the, one of the first times you've heard about th these guys, especially the InfoSec. But you really want to be friends with these guys. It, being friends will make your lives much, much easier. So now we're going to begin to see uh, the problems that are uh, inherent in this world. And the first one being that there's a gap between the developer and the user, because the developer only wants to code, and the user doesn't know how to install an application, how, how, how does it run, and what that. So this gap could be divided in two axes. The first axis is the ease of installation. And this is basically and essentially taken care of by the system administrator, uh, whether it be keeping the hosted app up and running or taking care to package the application so it can be installed by the users. The system administrator is the guy doing this. And the second axis is the security implications. So this is overseen by the InfoSec guy. Basically, the users uh, want their application and, and their data that they're putting into the application to be 100% secure, which we all know it will never be. Uh, and the developer might not be so focused on the security side of things. So here's when the uh, security administrator comes into the picture. Um, we're not going to see much more about the system administrator. The system administrator finally had a free weekend and is now enjoying his beer, so we're happy for him. So basically, at this point, InfoSec guy comes in, barges into the room, kicks off everyone's desk, and sets the office on fire. So we have the, these two axes that I just showed you, and the caveat here is that both axes are, in fact, related, because the more easy an application is to install, the, typically the less secure the application is, and vice versa. The second problem we have, and this is not inherently related to security, but more related uh, in an indirect way when we look at it in terms of packaging, is the dependencies problem. Uh, I'm sure everybody in this room at some point had to deal with dependencies. Uh, so basically, you have to ensure that you have all the dependencies every time you want to release your application. But not only do you have to make sure that you have all the right dependencies, you also have to make sure that you got the right versions of the dependencies. And eventually, this problem will get very, very, very large, and it's uh, what's colloquially known as dependency hell. So solving the dependencies problem is a thing, uh, and it's a thing that we must take care of. And in order to do that, we need to choose a packaging method. Now, there are many ways to package an application, and we're going to be looking at them right now. So the question will be, essentially, which one is the right one? Which ones do we choose? So 
Regarding the different approaches that we can take in packaging an application, this is uh, a part that I've been dealing with for a lot of years. Uh, let's go over one by one. The first one we have is the typical get it from the internet and run it, just in one line of bash or whatever. So this is what comes to my mind whenever I find an application that I want to try out and how to install it is something like this. So I'm blindly running code from the internet in 2017? Come on. You mean I shouldn't be looking at your code, I should just trust you. And finally, yeah, it, it's, it's only one command, it's all nice and packed, and all you had to do was build one big blob of binary shenanigans, but what is the cost? And I work in technical support. And with the amount of security vulnerabilities I see every day, this obscure approach, I, I seriously cannot fathom how many things can go wrong with this one. So let's forget about this for a second at least. So next up we have uh, GitHub or Git or any kind of version control where you uh, offer the version control version to, to your users. So show hands again everybody, how many of you install software from GitHub or Git or any other uh, repos? Okay, that's good. Now, uh, how many of you actually read the code you're installing? <laughs> okay, okay. That's good, actually. I thought no hands were going to be raised at this point. So, yeah, we're getting there. I mean, we need this, right? We need uh, a place to host our code. We, we hopefully, if we we're pursuing an open source approach, we're going to need it. Otherwise, nobody's going to respect us. Uh, at least everyone now gets to see the code, but as you saw, not everyone does. Um, ideally, when we have this approach, we can already start documenting the dependencies of our project. So that's kind of solves one of the problems. Uh, the person on the other end downloading your project should know what they're getting and what should they need to have in order for the application to run properly. Remember that not everyone reads the code, so this might not always be true. Um, do you know that there's nothing and nobody actually enforcing this? There's, there's no one forcing us to uh, put up a dependencies document or anything of that sort. You can basically upload anything you want to GitHub because you're a strong, independent human being, but that's not enough. You need to be a responsible adult, too. And last thing to note is that experienced users are going to look for this kind of approach because, like, uh, system administrators or InfoSec guys want to look at the code, want to know what the code has inside of it. So, yeah, we, sh we should always have this available, but it should not be the main way of packaging the application. Now, a rather new trend in the software world in the, in the last couple of years is to use Docker or background or whatever image format is the new hit in town. Uh, we have to admit this is quite easy to use and easy to install, and it's almost guaranteed to work. It also solves our dependencies problem because we can just bundle them all inside the, the image. Uh, that is, in fact, one of the main reasons for using this approach, forget dependencies. but. From the user's perspective, do we actually know what's inside the container? I mean, I know we're talking about an open format. Uh, we can disassemble it and look inside it, but we're not actually encouraged to do it. So it has a tendency to the dark side. And another problem with this approach is that somebody could be enticed to start bundling libraries and dependencies into it so that it, make it makes it way easier for users to use. And then at some point, you have basically a big blob of things, and also, when you have that many dependencies, you have to rebuild the image not only when you update the application, but also when the dependencies are updated, for example, in the case of a security vulnerability. So, basically, this is akin to inviting the slender man into your home. See what the dependency problem can take us. We just wanted to uh, make, the, have, make the application available for users, just a simple application, and now we have this mythological fearless creature in our living room. So the next approach is pip or pipi, which I'm uh, assuming many here are familiar with. Um, for sure, we are solving the dependencies problem uh, with pip or pipi, and not only that, we're doing it right. We're uh, gathering the dependencies from the same place, um, and it's with solutions like this where you really st need to uh, start thinking about community oversight. In scientific circles, this would be akin to peer review. You want somebody else to look at your application to find bugs and errors and whatnot. Now, there is some community oversight, 
uh, when you're installing a package from pip, when you're uploading, when you're uh, during the upload, after the upload. Uh, some, not all, and you're going to see why in a minute. Uh, there's also some digital signature support, uh, not in the way that we might know, uh, like GPG signatures. Um, it's rather via the uh, TUF framework, the up update upgrade framework. Um, unfortunately, the framework is outside the scope of this talk, so I really encourage you to go ahead and take a read. It's really good, and at least now someone is thinking about security. But one mean thing that can happen and has happened with PIP or PyPy uh, is what this guy, and I hope that I pronounced the name right, Nikolai Sacha, uh, once did. Uh, he did a study uh, wherein he submitted typo squatted package names to PyPy. So, for example, instead of uh, submitting simple JSON, he submitted JSON in the hopes that some user might install it. And he watched how many people installed those uh, fake packages. Um, that's linked to the, to the study. And believe me, there were lots and lots and lots of installations of these fake packages. And you know what's the scariest part in all of this? And the reason behind Nikolai's study is that PIP runs arbitrary code from the internet. I'm not saying PIP is not a solution. I'm just saying we should keep that in mind. Whenever you download a package, there's arbitrary code being run. And if you're not downloading the correct package, it's something bad is bound to happen. And so the last method that we're going to cover is distro-specific package management. Uh, this is aimed at Linux distributions. It can be RPM, uh, dev file, the works. And this is the part that requires the most work to set it up. But the thing here is that not necessarily you guys, the developers, have to do this work. Because the, the Linux distros have a teams of people called package maintainers. And the package maintainers, what they, what they do is basically take your application once your application has become a little bit famous and somebody wants to use it, and they'll package it for you. So they're kind of packagers as a service. And the approach uh, is relatively easy for end users to install because most distributions uh, right now have a graphical update manager in addition to the uh, console-based interface. And most importantly, uh, this is the approach that has the most potential in regards to security. Uh, distros can sign their own packages when they're in their software channels. And another good thing is that once you make it into a community-based distro uh, software channel, it is the community that is tasked with improving the, the application and sending you bug reports. All of this for the special low price of free. So it would take a lot of time to go over this whole process in detail, but uh, for those not familiar with it, rest assured it is one of the most enriching things that can happen to you as a software developer. So we've seen a, a fair share now of the different uh, packaging approaches in terms of security and what they can provide. So the question now is, where do we go from here? Now remember, we want to get from here to here. And I'm not saying we're going to make it just yet, not tomorrow, not the next week, but at least we have to start heading the right way. So we first have to at least start trying to solve the gap problem. So how do we tackle this one? It's very simple, we just communicate. It is not the definitive solution, but it is the mandatory first step. And one of the gap uh, problems axis was ease of installation. And a good way to reduce the gap on this axis is to have a good communication channel between developers and system administrators. And this is what the DevOps process is supposed to address, although in my opinion we still have a way to go. Um, but basically the developer uh, side should inform the sysadmin side about their application architecture and help them understand the design process and the system administrators, on the other hand, should inform the developers about the best practices regarding uh, operations. And if you do this right, we can get to a better place in terms of packaging itself and eventually make it better for the end users too. Now, for the security axis of the gap, the answer again is communication, and this time between developers and, and InfoSec administrators. Uh, an example of what can happen when communication in this regard fails is the shell shock vulnerability. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had this big vulnerability in Bash, which is the main interpreter in any Linux distro and Unix system. Um, so as the first patch was released, people started uh, scrutinizing Bash and the, and the patches more and more and more. And what happened is that on top of the original vulnerability, we've had not one, not two, but rather five different vulnerabilities, all in the span of a few days. 
And this happened in one of the most used pieces of software in the open source world. So it can happen to anyone, but if you communicate good and, and, and fast, you can prevent this. As for the dependencies problem, uh, a good starting point is to stop making it that easy for the users. Don't uh, expect the users to always be dumb. Give them some headway and let them, you know, tinker a little bit. And instead of choosing seemingly easy ways of delivering the application, prioritize the cleanest and the most open ones. They are out there. And a good example of this are package managers, whether it be language-specific package managers like PIP or OS-specific package managers like YUM or APT or whatever. And in fact, there are other alternatives that have sprung up in the past year or two, uh, like uh, Flatpak or Snap. Um, I don't have enough time in the talk to go over these ones, but they're relatively new and they're worth considering because the ecosystem appears to be wanting to take that path. And finally, if you really want an adventure, you can always go the distro way. Now, as you can probably tell by now, I am a little bit biased. Um, I do believe you have a good chunk of experience with the other methods, so the aim of this talk was to point out all the, the evident and not so evident problems and provide another way. And before going the distro way, it is important for you to understand the difference between a community-backed distro and an enterprise-backed distro. So, in a community-backed distro, the work is done mainly by volunteers, people who aren't being paid for that, and they're just doing that because they love it. Whereas in an enterprise-backed distro, of course, there's a company behind it, and there's tons of money behind it. So, sorry. Once you've gained enough traction in a community-based distro, uh, an enterprise distro will pick you up, and then you have like, more people looking at your code. And I'm making this distinction because there's a circle between community and enterprise. So companies of, often offer volunteers to community distros and then take the community improvements back into the products. So be, befriend the community and you befriend them all. But above all, you should really befriend the package maintainers. These are the people in charge of getting your software to the users. And if you communicate with them early and often, and if you let them know when a release is going to happen, maybe uh, a few days in advance, especially if we're talking about a security release, that'll make things so much better. And the idea is that you make this update cycle easy for them. And I mean this, make it easy for them. And looking at you, GitLab. All right, that's all. So now we have time for some questions, I believe. Thank you. Thank you for showing us the road to the fairy tale <laughs> world of unicorns. We really expected that. Uh, we're really short on time, so okay. I'm afraid we won't be able to have questions and answers. Okay, um, if you have any questions, you can find me around the conference the next few days. Just look for the guy in the black hat. That will be me. So sorry, I took more time than I, than I intended. Thank you again. <laughs>